Good afternoon. Prince Edward Islanders are voting today on a proposal to build a bridge or tunnel to the mainland. Premier Joe Giz says if the vote is strongly in favor of the scheme, it will go ahead. Premier Giz was among the first voters to cast his ballot today, but he won't say which way he voted. The Premier predicts a big turnout, as many as 90% of the island's 86,000 eligible voters. I think it's been a healthy thing for Prince Edward Island. Uh, people have had an opportunity to uh, express uh, uh, their opinion on this all-important question that has really been with us now since the 1880s. Haiti's presidential elections are being dismissed today as a total sham. Human rights groups and diplomats, as well as foreign journalists, reported all kinds of election irregularities. Most registered voters boycotted the elections, many concluding that the army would assure its own victory. Claude Adams reports on Haiti's losing struggle for democracy. Some observers say only 5 to 10 percent of eligible Haitians cast ballots yesterday, a turnout so low it could make the result meaningless when the votes are counted this week. There are also charges of voting fraud, of voters being trucked into the polling stations, and of money changing hands. Voters had their fingers marked with ink after they voted, but many people rubbed the ink off, and observers said they saw people voting more than once. Hundreds of thousands of voters stayed home as part of a boycott urged by the Catholic Church and other groups. Throughout the day, the army was out in force to prevent violence. One leading presidential candidate, Leslie Maniga, suggested the army would have a strong role if he formed a government. We are the only one to have emphasized the importance of the army in the building of the new Haitian democracy. Haiti's constitution requires the army to yield power in three weeks, but the irregularities of the election and the threat of further street violence could jeopardize that transition of power. Claude Adams, CBC News, Port-au-Prince. External Affairs Minister Joe Clark says Canada won't accept the results of the Haitian election. He called it a miscarriage of the electoral process and says his government will be reviewing its relations with Haiti, including foreign aid and trade commitments. Transport Minister John Crosby introduced new legislation today in a campaign to tighten up railway safety. Three railway accidents last week aroused criticism that safety regulations weren't being properly enforced. The new legislation will give the Transport Ministry greater power to act when railway regulations are ignored. Anna Maria Tremonti reports. Friday in Regina, two men, an engineer and a train man, were killed in a freight train collision. The day before, Thursday, two men were killed in Sudbury when a freight train loaded with iron ore hit another car. And last Wednesday, near London, Ontario, a Via Rail passenger train collided with a CN freight, sending 33 people to hospital. It is a grim coincidence that the bill brought in today will give the government more power to impose safety standards and safety checks on railways. It also brings into law several of the safety recommendations that stemmed from the investigation of this accident at Hinton, Alberta. 23 people were killed in February of 1986 in the country's worst railway disaster. As you know, transportation is, is essential for us as uh, the air that we breathe. But in meeting our economic needs, we can't compromise safety. We don't think that the public wishes any compromise with safety. Crosby has also released a committee report on the abuse of drugs and alcohol in the railway industry. Among its findings, 52% of those surveyed have said the use of alcohol by employees has compromised railway safety. It has recommended some forms of mandatory drug testing. Crosby says he wants to make that report public before deciding what to do. Anna Maria Tremonti, CBC News, Ottawa. The federal government is moving to end the six-week strike of grain handlers on the West Coast. The Minister of Labor, Pierre Cadieu, says he'll introduce legislation, possibly tomorrow, forcing the grain handlers back to work. The strike has crippled Canada's grain exports since it began in early December. Don Johnson says he's going to sit in the House of Commons as an independent liberal. Johnson once ran for the party leadership, but now he's broken with John Turner over the Meech Lake Accord on the Constitution and on free trade. Um, there are issues that I feel so strongly about that I'm not prepared to say I, I don't want to get into the, the debate for fear of creating uh, divisions in caucus, hence so I'd rather be outside the caucus. I thought about the alternatives. Uh, you know, there's been speculation that I might simply quit, um, but I don't think that that's a responsible position. Parliament is back in action today, and there should be plenty of action in this spring session. Both opposition parties believe we're into the run-up to an early election, and they'll be attacking the government on a range of issues, from free trade to ethics in government. 
The Conservatives, for their part, will try to capitalize on the internal problems of the Liberals and the NDP. We're joined by Don Newman, the host of This Week in Parliament. Don, there should be a lot of action in this Parliament, not only between the government and the opposition, but between the NDP and the Liberals, everybody trying to score points. You're absolutely right, Sheldon. The NDP have seen uh, from leading the polls early uh, last year, in the middle of last year, they now see their support starting to wane in Western Canada and in Quebec, so they'll be fighting hard to try and maintain their credibility in those areas. And of course, the Liberals are at the top of the polls, but the feeling is that their support is pretty soft, and the move by Don Johnston today to sit as an independent Liberal to leave the party caucus isn't going to help John Turner. In fact, it's going to revive the issue of Meech Lake and perhaps also free trade within the Liberal Party because Johnston feels strongly on that too. Don, the government says there isn't going to be an early election. It's business as usual. So what's on their agenda? Well, it's business as usual, but uh, any time after next fall an election would be uh, within the normal time frame for an election. The best bet probably is that there will be a fall election, and this will be the last sitting of Parliament before Canadians do go to the polls. On the agenda, of course, is the legislation to enact the free trade agreement. Uh, there's also the immigration bill. Remember, we all came back to work early last summer, Sheldon. Emergency legislation on immigrants arriving off the coast unannounced. That bill just cleared the Senate before Christmas. It's back before the House. There are 13 amendments. That could set up a fight between the government and the Senate again, so we could see some of that. There's also the pornography bill. There's also the anti-smoking bill. There'll be a big fight on that probably starting this week in committee. Don, on some of those matters, particularly free trade, the opposition actually plans to be obstructionist, doesn't it? Well, they certainly do. The NDP have said they'll do everything possible within the parliamentary system to block the legislation, to block the deal from going into effect. The Liberals are having a caucus starting tomorrow night and again on Wednesday, the regular caucus, to decide what their policies will be. But clearly it seems that the election is going to be fought around the free trade issue. The election campaign is probably really underway right now in the House of Commons, and free trade is going to be the big issue. There's going to be a lot of fighting over it. Don Newman in Ottawa, thanks very much. Sheldon, my pleasure. Support for free trade in Canada has risen in the past four months, according to a new Gallup poll out today. Nearly half the people surveyed say they back the deal. Only about a third oppose it. Two more people were arrested today in the ticket-fixing scandal in Manitoba. That brings to 18 the number of people facing charges, among them judges, prominent lawyers, and a top official with the Attorney General's Department. There was a crush of reporters and camera crews outside the courtroom in Winnipeg this morning when 16 people arrested on Friday were due to appear. But few of the defendants did show up. Most were represented by lawyers. Manitoba's chief provincial judge and another judge who faces charges of obstructing justice or conspiracy were remanded until February the 2nd. Others were ordered to appear in late January and February. Police claim many of them received money and goods in return for fixing traffic tickets. On the financial markets, the dollar was up a bit at 77.80 cents U.S. Gold was down $2 at 4.75 American. On the stock exchanges, in Toronto, the 300 composite index was up less than a point. That's up 0 0.90. In New York, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was down slightly, 2.82. A push is on to get sled dog racing included as an Olympic event. A competition later this month in Canmore, Alberta, will showcase the sport to international Olympic members. Cass Rusi reports on a young competitor who's hoping someday to win Olympic gold. Good girl, good. Amy Harris is in training. So are her dogs. The Alberta International Sled Dog Classic in Canmore is about a week away, and Amy wants her team to be ready. Most of Amy's dogs are Alaskan Huskies. They're known for their intelligence, their endurance, and their love of running. Good dog. Amy Good Harris dog. started Come sled on. dog racing four years ago when she was 12. Good Not dog. too many of her teenaged friends share her interest, Good. but the sport is becoming more and Good. more popular. There are efforts now underway to get sled dog racing back into the Olympics. The International Federation of Sled Dog Sports hopes to have sled dog racing as a demonstration sport in the 1992 Winter Olympics in Albertville, France. Amy Harris thinks sled dog racing deserves Olympic status. She says the races are not only challenging and physically demanding, but in some ways tougher than any other Olympic sports. When you work with yourself, you know yourself, but you have to get to know the dogs and their personalities and you know what they want to do. International Olympic Committee members have been invited to observe the Canmore sled dog competition. Mushers will be working hard to impress them in the hopes of earning a spot in future games. Cass Rusi, CBC News, near Canmore, Alberta. And that's the news at midday. For CBC News, I'm Sheldon Turcotte.
Now back to Valerie Pringle and Ian Hedelmanzi. Back coming up on midday, a man convicted of destroying an El Al jetliner and killing one man in Athens 20 years ago as one landed immigrant status in Canada. We'll talk to the reporter who uncovered the story. Tom Yu is going to review Dan Aykroyd's latest movie. Catherine O'Hara has some good news for seafood lovers. We will have a profile of musician Rye Cooter, but our first story, the Winnipeg court scandal.